the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror media. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at the second season of Stranger Things, released to Netflix in 2017. After the enormous success of the first season of Stranger Things, Netflix immediately ordered a second from the writer-director duo Matt and Ross Duffer. Though the twin brothers had originally considered making the show an anthology series, or doing a big time jump to see the characters as adults, a la It, they realized that what made the people fall in love with the show was their cast of kid actors, so they brought them all back and kept the story chug luggin Stranger Things 2 takes place about a year after the first season, and primarily focuses on the upside-down stowaway that came to our world through Will Byers, a plotline hinted at in the closing moments of the season 1 finale. The season also sees Eleven, now in the care of Chief Hopper, becoming more independent and wanting to learn more about her backstory, which leads to the most divisive episode of the entire series in Chapter Chapter 7, The Lost Sister. For the most part, I felt like Stranger Things 2 was a serviceable and slightly darker follow-up to the first season. It didn't feel quite as special, but that's not surprising. Hard to capture that same sense of wonder a second time. If I had a complaint, it'd be that it feels like it loves itself a bit too much. Unlike the more earnest and unproven first season, this is now a show that knows it's big and popular, and knows that its characters are beloved. That's how we end up with a ton of sweeping group shots that feel like album covers to me. But I get it. I would also be quite proud if Stranger Things were my show. Instead, my show's The Kill Count, and that's fine too. So while there are a few too many on-the-nose needle drops, and Mike Wheeler spends most of the season being a whiny turd, the new characters, from the spunky Max to the wholesome Bob to the downright terrifying Billy, bring a freshness to the show that helps carry this season through its extended runtime. Mostly, though, it's just nice to hang out in Hawkins again. Reminder that in my videos covering season one, I talked a lot about cast and crew members who returned for this sequel season. Since I don't want to repeat too much info, be sure to watch those to learn all about the people behind the show. Now it's time to head back to Hawkins and see how many kills we find there. The season begins in the city, Pittsburgh to be exact, almost a year after the events of season one. An alarm bell signals that we're witnessing a crime, one committed by masked 80s punks rocking classic 80s punk hair. This diverse group of misfits flees the police in their van, but when they just can't seem to shank them, their leader, named Callie, directs driver Mick towards a tunnel, then closes her eyes for a shakalaka, comma, boom. It crumbles a bridge that stops the cops, even though it didn't actually happen. Turns out Callie only made them perceive that the bridge had fallen apart, and all it took for her to do it was one little nosebleed. Say, that nosebleed and that wrist tattoo look mighty familiar. Almost as familiar as this title card! <laughs> I said the thing. Y'all just love it, don't ya? It's Halloween time in Hawkins, Indiana, which is as good a time as any to hit up the Palace Arcade. It's here that our favorite foursome, Will Byers, Mike Wheeler, Dustin Henderson, and Lucas Sinclair, convenes to play Dragon's Lair, a QTE lady Laserdisc game that was probably the most popular of 1983. And not exactly because of its gameplay. You know what I'm saying, you know what I mean. Dustin's dirt gets burnt, but that's not as bad as finding out he no longer has the high score on Dig Dug. That spot's been taken by someone named Mad Max. Will Byers is still feeling the effects of his sojourn to another dimension, occasionally seeing himself back inside the Upside Down, where the sky is mighty spooky. But calm down, you scared little bastard. This hellish vision is just a hallucination. In reality, Will's feet are still right side up. His peers at school haven't forgotten about the time he was declared dead, and their bullying makes it hard for Will to enjoy a presentation about the human brain by their science teacher, Mr. Clark. The lesson is interrupted by a new student's arrival, who was just dropped off by her scorpion of a stepbrother. Oh, and the ladies of Hawkins High are mighty fond of that boy Stinger. Would you check out that ass? Just look at it go. The new student from California is Max Mayfield, played by Sadie Sink, who once sucker punched David Cross in an episode of Kimmy Schmidt. Knockout game! Oh! Oh! He didn't go down. The boys realize that Max must be Mad Max of Dig Dug fame so they scope out this high-scoring skateboarder at lunch, though their spying efforts don't go unnoticed. Stop spying on me, creeps. Well, shit. Creeps? Come on, Max. Would a creep wait outside the arcade and watch for you through binoculars? Actually, don't answer that. She will not be able to resist these pearls. 
You're making it worse, Dusty. Dustin's new teeth for this season are actually a fake set, since actor Gaten Matarazzo's real front teeth still hadn't come in by time of production. The purr, however, was all Gaten, derived from his Chewbacca impression. It Where? starts off with my Did Chewy impression. Mm -hmm. That's not the Chewy. <laughs> Me. My Chewy impression. Yeah. It needs a little work. Dustin and Lucas watch as Max is dropped off by her stepbrother, with whom she doesn't have the best relationship, and it becomes apparent real fast that this season about to have a love triangle. Mad Max. After a montage that screams, this is 1984, even though it's anachronistically scored by a 1985 Oingo Boingo song, we wind up at Melville's general store in Hawkins Square, where Joyce Byers still works. What's new in her life, though, is a boyfriend named Bob Newby, played by best hobbit Sean Astin, in a casting decision that fuels the show's 80s nostalgia, thanks to his role in The Goonies. And I'll say it right now, I fucking love Bob Newby, even if we have different tastes when it comes to movies. Tell Jonathan not to pick anything scary. I hate scary movies. Joyce picks up Will from school for an appointment at Hawkins Lab, where they're joined by police chief Jim Hopper in all his protective paternal glory. At the lab, they speak with the new head scientist there, Dr. Sam Owens, played by Paul Reiser, another 80s nostalgia casting choice thanks to his role in Aliens as the smarmy, duplicitous company man, Burke. His casting was also meant to make you immediately distrust this character. The minute you know, I show up in season two, the audience is going, yeah, I just, this is not gonna go well. Will tells Owens, and unknowingly, some cigarette smoking scary guys, that he's been having flashes to the Upside Down, where he feels an evil presence watching him and waiting to kill everyone. Owens brushes it off, though, and says it's probably just trauma, since they're coming up on the anniversary of Will's demododging last year. Which, of course, came about thanks to an Upside Down gate inadvertently opened by Eleven, which continues to be a problem to this very damn day. Burn it with fire! Nancy Wheeler and Steve Harrington are still dating, but that doesn't stop her from being friends with Jonathan Byers and inviting him to a Halloween party so he won't stay inside by himself all night. You're gonna be home by eight listening to the Talking Heads. Um, excuse me, Nancy. The name of the band is Talking Heads. She and Steve visit the home of Barb Holland, whose parents are still obsessing over the disappearance of their daughter. Since Nancy and Steve aren't allowed to tell them the whole upside-downy truth, they've decided to put their house up for sale to hire private investigator Murray Bowman, who's played by comedian Brett Gelman and who was seen earlier talking to Chief Hopper about the possibility of Russian spies in Hawkins. I'm talking multiple reports now, multiple reports reports, okay, of a Russian child in Hawkins. A child? What are you talking about, a child? A girl who may have psionic abilities. Nancy's guilt is so heavy that it gives her bathroom breakdowns, and I love that they deal with the fallout from Barb's death in this season. Helps make it feel consequential. Their dilemma is totally believable, too, as Steve later points out to Nancy that they're powerless against the U.S. government's cover-up. They could put us in jail, okay, or worse, they could destroy our family. They can do anything they want. Yeah, things are pretty rough when you're not Uncle Sam's favorite niece or nephew. After a movie night at the buyer's home, where Bob gets a fucking kick out of Mr. Mom, Will wakes up in the middle of the night and experiences another psychic transportation to the Upside Down, in a shot that serves as a direct homage to Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Damn, Upside Down, your weather's been pretty wild lately. Wonder if it has anything to do with the 50-story behemoth on the horizon there. Hmm. Chief Hopper finishes a long day of investigating rotten pumpkin patches and parks his car at a cabin in the woods. He steps over tripwires and knocks a specific pattern on the door before entering, not wanting to scare the other inhabitant inside, who is revealed to be Eleven, now living with him and growing out her locks. Now, you may ask yourself, how did she get here? Well, after giving that demogorgon some corporal punishment, Eleven was briefly transported to the Upside Down. For these flashbacks, Eleven needed to have her short hair cut, but everyone was understandably reluctant to shave Millie Bobby Brown's head again. The solution came from the married couple managing the season's huge amount of visual effects work. Senior VFX supervisor Paul Graff and senior VFX producer Christina Graff. They oversaw the show's nearly 2,000 VFX shots, including giving Eleven a digital haircut by tracking this buzz cut to her head. I think it's pretty damn impressive. Eleven found a way out through the hole the Demogorgon made when it burst into the season one finale, and 
Then, using her brain powers to make it more eleven-sized, she pierced her way through the bubblegum membrane and returned to the right side up. She went back to the Wheeler home, only to find it uninviting, with government agents all over the place, ensuring everyone there would stay hush-hush. At least they don't have to worry about Mike's dad, Ted. Understood. We're all patriots in this house. Your boots, sir. Although Mike saw Eleven through the window, she was gone before he could talk to her, fleeing into the woods until eventually winding up in Hopper's cabin. Mike's been a little sad boy ever since, reminiscing about Eleven and trying to call her on the radio in vain. Eleven wants to go trick-or-treating, arguing that no one would know it was her beneath a costume, but Hopper ixnays that and play. We don't take risks, all right? They're stupid. And? We're not stupid. Exactly. He instead promises a night of scary movies and candy, but how could that compare to dressing up like a gosh dang Ghostbuster? Bustin makes you feel good! Well, maybe not Mike. He's still emo and not in the mood for his mom Karen's photo sesh. But the other boys are happy to have their costumes photo documented by Jonathan and Joyce, by Dustin's mom Claudia and their cute kitty Muse, and by Lucas's unnamed mother and his unimpressed sister Erica. You are such a nerd. Shut up. They get to the school where Mike and Lucas argue over who gets to be Bill Murray. You're Winston. I specifically didn't agree to Winston. Dude, I agree with Lucas. Winston sucks. He joined the team super late. He's not funny, and he's not even a scientist. Completely valid points. Even though nobody else wore their costumes to school, Dustin and Lucas strike up the nerve to talk to Max and show off their gadgetry. They invite her to go trick-or-treating with them that night, but it doesn't look like she's into it. Sorry, boys. Max is picked up after school by her stepbrother, Billy, who you can tell is a badass because of his denim tux, the speed at which he drives his Camaro, and the Ted Nugent blaring from his speakers. He's a real scary doucher who hates Hawkins so much much, he nearly runs down its residence in the middle of the road. Yeah! That was a close one, huh? Billy's played by the then 22-year-old Perth-born Dacre Montgomery, last seen on the kill count in a short but memorable role in Better Watch Out. Billy's irredeemable bully character is basically what Steve was supposed to be before Joe Keery charmed the Duffers into writing a bigger, more sympathetic role for him. In real life, though, Dacre Montgomery seems like a nice guy, too. I'm not really like that. This isn't who I am. Okay, right What's now, or the character? <laughs> uh -huh. Says he got the role after sending in a pretty unorthodox audition tape. It came out that I was wearing a, a G-string at one point or another. And, you were uh, wearing a G-string for the audition? Part of it. I may have been. Uh, I got a movie coming up. You want to send me an audition tape? Hopper gets to work to find more rotten pumpkins on the docket. In fact, there are sights of blight all over Hawkins. And near some of these gross fly-filled gourds, Hopper finds a sticky slime all over the trees. Yuck. Will's been drawing pictures of the giant Lovecraftian monster he saw, and although that's concerning to Joyce, she still allows him to go trick-or-treating. Jonathan drops him off and gives him a video camera to record his adventures, then decides to go to the party dance he told him about, a real cool kid Halloween jamboree where Billy's making a name for himself and inheriting Steve's old shitty friend Tommy H. Of course that fuck's dressed like Johnny Lawrence. Hopper's podunk and pumpkin investigation takes him late into the evening, meaning he's gonna be late for his movie night with Eleven, who has spent the day looking out the window and thinking back to when she had to telekinetically kill squirrels for food. Mm. Mind kill. For a while, she was stuck using flying flaming squirrel meat to keep herself hidden and warm, but eventually she found the food stash Hopper kept setting out for. Too bad the guy can't keep his Halloween promises, though. The boys are trick-or-treating when they're confronted by a shape. <laughs> Look on your faces. Yeah, it's Maxine Myers and Dustin and Lucas Lackey. They try to impress her with their best Californian accents. Totally tubular. As Mike complains about the changes in their party roster, he steps away from Will, who gets teased by Wolfman and Jasons until he falls ass backwards right into the upside down. Damn, kid. Hope you're getting frequent flyer miles for all your trips to this place. He watches as the enormous and frankly fucking terrifying shadow monster rises 
reaches up into the sky, which scares Will down some stairs until Mike finds him and teleports him back into the real world. Man, that poor little Byers boy. Nancy's not happy that Steve just wants to move past Barb's death, so she starts going hard on the Halloween party punch. By the time Jonathan gets there, she's a stumbling slob with a solo cop, who only gets sloppier when Steve tries to stop her from further consumption. They go to the bathroom to clean her up, where her portrayal of drunkenness veers from completely realistic It's not coming off, Nancy. It's coming. Do a tad bit over the top. You're bullshit. What? You're you're pretending like like everything's okay. Since Nancy basically says she doesn't love Steve, he leaves upset. Thankfully, Johnny Bye Bye's still around to make sure she gets home safely and tucked into her Betty Bye. Hopper gets home to 11 and apologizes for being so late, but she doesn't open her bedroom door for him. She's too busy using static and a blindfold to take a trip into the void. There, she sees Mike inside his blanket fort trying to radio for her. So although she's not allowed to contact him, at least she knows he's thinking of her. That's that's worth a bloody nose, right? Dustin gets home from trick-or-treating to find his trash can shaking something awful. He thinks it might be his kitty muse, but when he looks inside, he finds something that he puts in his Ghostbusters box and takes into his room. It's a little tadpole-like creature that he drops into his reptile tank. It doesn't like the heat lamp, but it does like Three Musketeers. So Dustin names the creature after the narrating friend of the three inseparables. D'Artagnan. After another flashback showing when Eleven and Hopper finally met up in the woods, we come back to their present tension, which he begins to ease with a disgustingly sweet breakfast monstrosity. He promises her that she can see Mike soon, but he's been saying that bullshit for a year now, and Eleven's sick of hearing it. Friends, don't lie! Since Bob stayed the night last night, get him, Bob! He agrees to save Joyce some time by taking Will to school. What do you say, big guy? You want to go for a ride in the Bobmobile? Hell yeah, dude! Bobmobile it up! During the ride, Bob tells Will about Mr. Baldo, a scary clown who haunted his childhood dreams until his dream self finally stood his ground. I said, go away. Go away! Hope that advice works out for you, Will. Hop and his cops review the farms with bad crops, and the chief realizes that they're all in a circle, radiating out from Hawkins' lab. He takes these findings to Dr. Owens and tells him that he'd better make sure there's no upside down leaking out the lab. Better make damn sure. I keep things nice and quiet for you. Mm -hmm. And you keep your shit out of my town. That is the deal. Eleven thinks back to when Hopper first took her to his grandpa's cabin and called it her new home. They made the place clean and secure, and Hopper told Eleven she'd be safe with him as long as she followed his rules. Chief among them, don't ever go out alone. I call him the, uh, don't be stupid rules. Yeah, good try, Hop, but Elle's being stupid right now, stepping over trip wires to head out on her own. She comes across a mom and her kid, which reminds her of a time when she asked Hopper about her mom. When she asked if her mom was gone, Hopper said yes, which you'd probably have to fact check as mostly false, depending on how you interpret the word gone. Steve and Nancy's relationship is still frayed from their fight at the party, so she talks to Jonathan instead about how guilty she feels over Barb. Seeing a kid with a tape player, Nancy comes up with an idea, so she and Jonathan go to her house and call up Barb's mom. They ask her to meet them at a public park and mention that it's possible someone's listening to their conversation. I, I can't tell you here, on the phone. And of course, they're right about that. Damn, Hawkins Lab, you so nosy! With a little help from her tech-inclined boyfriend, Joyce plugs their camera into the TV so she can see what Will saw on Halloween night. The tape reveals a staticky outline of a familiar shape, and when Joyce traces it, she confirms her her suspicions. That there's the scary thing! During lunch, Dustin shows the gang, including Max, his new pet D'Artagnan, nicknamed Dart. He doesn't know what kind of animal Dart is, but he knows the little feller don't like heat, which is weird for a reptile. But maybe not all that weird for an upside down slug, huh Will? Will tells his friends that he thinks Dart came from the upside down, but not Max of course. She's not allowed him to know. Mike and Lucas want to take Dart to Hopper, but Dustin's grown too attached. We have a bond. Like a father-son bond. And look at that little boy grow. He's reached his quadrupedal teens. Dart darts off right as Max cracks open the door, and he dips, dives, and dodges to get away from the kids. They split off to track him down, and when Mike runs into Max during their search, he straight up tells her he doesn't want her in the party. She ain't no L. Speaking of whom, Eleven gets to the school just in time to see Mike talking to another girl. So she has a cow man and knocks Max down, disappearing before Mike can figure out that Max 
Max just got telekinetic tripped. During the search for Dart, Will finds himself in the Upside Down, running down the hall from a smoke monster chasing after him. Dustin gets to Dart before the others and hides him under his hat as Mike arrives and asks, hey, where the heck is Will? Well, I'll tell you, Mike, that boy's running through the Upside Down and considering words of wisdom from inspirational football players. With Bob's baldo busting advice in mind, he turns around and stands his ground. Hardy little fella, if a bit screamy poopy pants face. His yelling doesn't deter the evil shadow monster though, which face hugs him in every orifice with a whole bunch of tentacles. Well, that was gross to say. The giant shadow monster, which was advertised right off the bat for this season, was designed by Paul and Christina Graff, who had matte painter Steve Messing draw up concept art that incorporated storm clouds and tornadoes into the monster's appearance. For this scene, when it attacks Will's face, storyboard artist Michael Marr made concept paintings that were then filmed in an awesome way. Multiple cameras circled Noah Schnapp on a track, with one filming him in front of a green screen and another filming clean background to use behind him. Finally, effects company Hydraulics took all this concept art and turned it into the amazing visual effects that you see. A whole lot of people involved to bring this thing to life, but you know what they say, it takes a video village to raise a monster. Will is standing in the field, huffing shadow fumes in the upside down, when Joyce comes to pick him up. She takes him home, where he says he doesn't remember what happened, so Joyce breaks out the receipts and gets him to admit that he saw a scary monster, and that the scary monster is now in inside of him. That's probably why his temperature is running super low, and though Joyce tries to raise it with a nice warm bath, Will the Whack reacts to it like she was looking to boil him alive. He likes it cold. Eleven gets back home late to find an irate Chief Hopper in full-on angry dad mode. Don't walk away from me! He yells at her for breaking his idiot rules, then tries to ground her from egos and TV. But Eleven loves cheers, and since he just cut her off from Sam and Diane, she yells that he's no better than her papa. She openly uses her powers against him and storms into her room, her psychic temper tantrum climaxing with a window explosion, which was done practically and without a stunt double for David Harbour. The next morning, Nancy and Jonathan go to meet Barb's mom at the park as planned. When they get there, they notice people potentially spying on them. Dudes with newspapers, brightly attired joggers, kids playing games. Don't count out kid spies, they're the most ruthless. It ends up that pretty much everyone there is a spy, jury's still out on the kids and Nancy and Jonathan find themselves caught by a bunch of G-men. They're taken to Hawkins' lab, where Dr. Owens lectures them about trying to spill their beans. He blames Brenner and the previous employees for killing Barb and upside-downing Will, and says that he's the new boss, who's not the same as the old boss. The most important thing right now is to contain the upside-down and keep it a secret, lest the Russians find out and try to weaponize it somehow. The more attention we bring to ourselves, the more, the more people like the Hollands know the truth the more likely that scenario becomes. So quit trying to blab to people. We've got this. They let the kids go, and we see that these two future journalists just tape recorded themselves a scoop. The ones responsible for what happened to your brother and Miss Holland's death, they're gone. Evidence in hand, they drive out of Hawkins. After trying but failing to make amends with Eleven, Hopper is called to the buyer's home, where Joyce shows him her little popsicle boy Will, who says the scary shadow monster wants to keep things nice and chill. He also says he's been given memories that aren't his own. Memories of death and of sliding down water slides? He's having a hard time saying what he's seeing in words, so they try to get him to draw it all out. But uh, maybe try drawing a little better there, Will. Those are scribbles. Unable to return to where everybody knows her name, Eleven reluctantly cleans the cabin until she finds a hatch in the floor that leads to a crawl space full of memories. Some fun, others undoubtedly less fun. And also one that may be relevant to her. Inside the box labeled Hawkins Lab, Eleven finds a file on Terry Ives, who once had a baby Jane. Whatever happened to her? She finds a picture of Terry with her papa and takes a blindfolded visit to the moist void to see what's up. There she finds Terry in a rocking chair, murmuring something to herself over and over. Terry senses that Eleven's there and calls out her Christian name. Jane. 
leaving L to learn a new word. Mama. Yeah, mama. It's like papa, only I guess dustier. Max is sick of being left out of all the cool conversations, so she tells Lucas she's done having friends that aren't fully friends. I don't want to be in your stupid party anyway. The argument is seen by Billy when he comes to pick her up, and uh, I don't like the way he's looking at Lucas there. There are certain types of people in this world that you stay away from. Yeah, something tells me he doesn't mean the kind of people who rock corduroy jackets. Dustin gets home and finds that Dart is no longer in his cage. Instead, he shed some skin and is now a drippy big boy. A trippy big boy who eats cats? Aw, oh, Dart, you fucking suck, dude. Don't give me that sass, that's a bad Dart. The reveal of Dart's petal mouth confirms that he came from the upside down. In fact, Dart the Demodog is just an adolescent Demogorgon, whose five stages of evolution, tadpole, frog, cat, dog, and fully grown, were designed by Aaron Sims Creative, who of course did the original Demogorgon design for season one. The effects company Hydraulics then added texture and designed the animal's internal organs and muscle structure, which you can sometimes see during its first two stages when its skin is still translucent. On set, they had 3D printed and silicone gel models so the actors could work with something tactile, even if it was just being pulled on a string sometimes. Other times, a marble was used as a stand-in, like when Dart was Tokyo drifting down the hallway. Will continues to draw reams of his raw dreams, and Joyce figures out that his scribbles are all part of a bigger picture. She and Hop get to taping them together leading to another Joyce Byers project that, while maybe not as iconic as the alphabet lightboard, is still a pretty good visual set piece for the show. These scribbles were all over the universal maze at Halloween Horror Nights. With a closer look, Hopper realizes what's being drawn. He's drawing vines. So he heads to the rotten pumpkin patch, where he starts digging until he taps into hollow ground. Climbing down into this hole, he finds himself in a tunnel that's got all sorts of vines and dandruff floating around. In other words, a tunnel that's looking pretty damn upside down. Joyce's latest arts and crafts project has taken over her home, but it hasn't helped them figure out what's wrong with Will, who tells Mike that he feels the monster taking over. It's like he's reaching into Hawkins more and more, and the more he spreads, the more connected to him I feel. Mike says maybe they can use this connection as a weapon. Will can be a sweaty spy boy that informs them about the shadow monster. You know, as long as it doesn't backfire. What if he spies back? Well, that would be bad. Dustin gears himself up in old hockey pads and prepares to capture Dart with bologna, the worst of all deli offerings. His trail of processed garbage meat gets Dart out of the house, and when the little fucker figures out that something untoward is going on, Dustin has no choice but to knock his pet into a storm cellar and lock it up inside. I'm sorry. You ate my cat. Eleven gets a ride from a friendly trucker to the house of Ives, and when her Aunt Becky doesn't let her in, not knowing who she is, Eleven just ups and invites herself inside. I want to see Mama. She tries to talk to her mama, only to get the same jumble of words she saw her saying in the void. But after catching up with her aunt a bit, Eleven realizes that Terry is trying to interact with them through flickering lights. Judging by that bloody nose, one thing is certain. She wants to talk. Nancy and Jonathan have left Hawkins to visit that Murray Bowman guy, who already knows their names as he welcomes them inside his flea bag home. He's got a whole damn layer of corkboard theories about Hawkins, Will Byers, and of course, Barb Holland, whose disappearance he's being paid to investigate. Little did he know, he just stumbled across a bunch of shortcuts. The girl with the buzzed hair, she's not Russian, she's from Hawkins Lab. Her name was Eleven. He worked on this story for a year, and they just, they blurted it out. Max goes to the Palace Arcade and is tricked into meeting with Lucas, who wants to tell her about what happened in season one, even though it might be hazardous to her health. You could be arrested. Possibly. Killed. At first she thinks it's a made up story meant to be a joke at her expense, but eventually his shit your pants seriousness convinces her he's telling the truth. Aw, glad to see the make up. Billy, he's uh, he's not as happy to see it. Hopper's lost inside floating skin flake central trying to find his way out using a trail of tobacco. Will sees the chief in a dream and draws the coordinates on a fresh sheet of scribbles, which Mike and Joyce match to the rest of the mess all over her walls. They don't know what it means exactly, but someone just rolled up who might be able to help them find the X. What's at the X? Pirate treasure? No, ya goon. Bob the Brain quickly figures out that the drawings are actually a map of Hawkins. Yeah, that's a... Uh... 
Satlus Quarry, then gets mathematical and cartographical up in this bitch to figure out the location of the X that marks the hop. Maybe just look for the picture that has a bunch of pissed off vines in it, because that's what the chief is presently struggling with. Will's drawings of the tunnel system, which my assistant Veronica wonderfully recreated for the set back there, were mapped out by returning production designer Chris Trujillo, who made sure the tunnel drawings actually fit into a map of Hawkins that they had created for geographical continuity. That's way more work than the showrunners of Lost were ever willing to do. Then the prop team created all the individual drawings you see using 1,500 crayons and 3,000 sheets of paper. They were led by prop master Linda Rice, who also did props for American Beauty. She's the one who found that beautiful plastic bag. With no one answering their radios, Dustin goes to the Wheeler house to collect Mike, only to find out that neither Wheeler child is home. Steve shows up with flowers, hoping to get back into Nancy's good graces, and since he's the only assistance available, Dustin hitches his ride to Harrington and begins the greatest goddamn relationship this show will ever give us. Fuck yes, Dustin! Dustin? Nancy and Jonathan show Murray their tape and ask him if it's enough evidence to blow the lid off of Hawkins' lab. Through some vodka and Billy Holiday, Murray lays out the problem they face. Though he believes them, the American public won't, because they like it when things are simple. The minute someone with an ounce of authority calls bullshit, everyone will nod their heads and say, see? Ha! I knew it! It was bullshit. Yeah, Murray's not a fan of the overpowered U.S. government. His blood does not run red, white, and blue. He does not have a bald eagle heart. Together, though, he and Nancy figure out a plausible PR strategy. They can water down the accusation and, instead of talking about aliens or some shit, say that Barb was killed by a chemical exposure from Hawkins' lab. Something scary but familiar. Yeah, three cheers to radiation. At the Ives' home, Eleven hops into the void so she can speak to Ted. Aw, I bet her mom will love that, huh? No. Okay, maybe she won't. Sorry. Through a memory montage, we see the origin of the words that Terry keeps repeating. Breathe comes from when she went into labor, wherein Dr. Brenner delivered her very much alive child. Sunflower is what she saw when she woke up and was lied to, being told her baby died. Then three to the right and four to the left were the combination needed to crack open a gun safe. She took that gun into Hawkins' lab and used it to murder a guard, shooting him in the chest. She was able to track down baby Jane slash Alexa who was with another young girl in a room marked with a rainbow, another one of Terry's words. Finally, 450 was how many volts of electricity Doc Brenner administered during the electroshock therapy that left her how she is today. Three. Sunflower. Rainbow. 450. Three. Three to the right. Three. Far to the left. Damn, that is a messed up shit. Mike, Bob, and the Byerses drive to where Hopper should be based on Will's drawing. They find nasty tentacle vines in the ground, and after Joyce hacks away at them with a shovel, she and Bob hop down into the tunnel. Are we in Will's map? They follow Hop's trail of broken cigarettes and find him getting choked by vines, but they're able to rescue him by cutting and stabbing at the tentacles. Hey, <laughs> Bob. Hey, Jim. All of a sudden, though, some Hawkins lab peeps show up, and after giving Hopper a second to Indiana Jones his hat, they start flamethrowing away at the vines. Unfortunately, the incineration also hurts Will, and I don't mean just a little. That boy's in bad shape. And that's where episode 5 of Stranger Things 2 ends. The next four episodes will finish out the season and give us a whole lot more kills to count, so don't you worry. I'll look at that on Friday, along with giving you the numbers and awards, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Jacob Palacios, Noam Orange, Joshua South, Jalen Combs, Parker Tobiah, Stephanie Richard, and Jenna Lizer. And another huge thanks to Veronica for coming over and doing all these drawings and putting them up. Great work. We'll be finishing this up on Friday and then idle hands on Saturday. Thanks, everyone. Be good people.